Well, um, thank you everybody for, for coming. Uh, my name is Kevin Cox. I'm um, the chair of Devon Birds, and um, we're going to talk about house parties. It's fantastic to see such a great turnout um, on a beautiful sunny Friday evening to talk about these fantastic birds. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Dartmoor House Martin project afterwards, but first of all I'd like to introduce you to John Waters. Many of you will uh, know John. He's a local naturalist. Um, you've not either seen him at talks like this or know him from radio or from television where he's done his work as well. So John's going to tell you a little bit more about the natural history, the ecology of these birds and take you through uh, those and related species as well. Uh, and then talk a little bit about um, some of the reasons why house martins are in trouble at the moment. And then I'm going to talk about the Dartmoor House Martin Project and suggest ways that we can do things uh, to improve the fortunes for this fantastic bird. So um, I'm going to hand you straight over to John Waters and uh, tell you about it. Thank you very much. Okay, well thanks for coming along. Nice, nice to see so many people here. Uh, I'm going to give you a talk for about 20 minutes on house martins and their uh, related species of swallows and swings. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a brief introduction to myself for those who don't know me. Uh, I've lived on Dartmoor for about 26, 7 years now. Uh, so I know the, the area pretty well. I originally come from Hampshire. I grew up on Lady Island in Hampshire. Went down to college at Falmouth, found the Park College, and then ended up working in the National Park. And now I work as a freelance wildlife consultant. Uh, just a few images which I've uh, gathered over the year. I'm out most days. In fact, I haven't been home today. I've been out in the public I just haven't got home. My wife and I see if you have any curry with uh, teacher friends. So I'm going to get a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things I've seen recently is uh, some woodwalkers who seem to have had a good breeding season in the Dark Valley. These were young birds which I watched fledge in the nest. Uh, Emperor moths and the uh, hairy footed flower bees. Some of you may have seen a short film which is on Spring Watch uh, this year, all about these bees which we filmed uh, out into churches. And the long tailed tips, some of my favourite winter activities watching this uh, suite of birds. Um, high brown chilleries in the Dark Valley, which is still flying at the moment, and it's a very good year for me this year. I can go up towards Newbridge Way and have a look in among all the bramble flowers there. You have a very good chance of seeing one of Dartmoor's specialities. Uh, four finches and uh, a sleepy bee, which is going to stop in the flowers. The flower closes up in the afternoon, and the bee gets tucked up in there for the night. Quite sweet of And that was up at Ace Tour at Newbridge as well. So I've been a naturalist ever since I was tiny. I've always been fascinated by the natural world. And I, I explore the natural world mainly through drawing and painting in the field. Um, I do take a lot of photographs now and video as well, but I tend to, uh, I don't actually draw from photos, I always draw from the living thing. Uh, so these are some long wall bees I've been watching a lot down at Cruel Point, which are still flying at this time of the year. And I use these illustrations and photographs in a, in a number of publications, including the Dharma magazine. I, I do a little wildlife sketchbook <coughs> on each issue, and I provide the photographs for Nick Baker's article. Uh, about nine years ago, I wrote a book with Norman Baldock, the former ecologist at the National Park on the wildlife of Dharma. And this covers all the habitats of Dharma and shows you some of the special wildlife which can be found within the National Park. And I also work as a consultant entomologist mainly. I do a bit of work on birds as well, but uh, I'm sort of more of a creepy crawly mini beast man. And uh, sort of do various jobs, including looking for this, the world's rarest spider, uh, called the horrid ground weaver. And this is uh, only found in Plymouth. It's an endemic species to Plymouth. Uh, it's found in a few quarries there, and only 70 individuals have ever been seen anywhere in the world. And I found about 40 of those, so I can say that's even more than anyone else on the planet. Um, it's quite a small spider. It's, a spider. So it's probably not surprising that uh, not that many people have found it, and it's mainly active during the winter time. I've also done, as Kevin said, I've done quite a lot of work for television uh, over the years with the BBC and other companies, 
and in recent years I've done quite a few short films of one show. Uh, there was one on last week on bee or moths and one previously on oil beans, which was on recently. And this is one I made with Mike Dilger down on the coast of Brownscombe on the courtship habits of the Rufus Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. And uh, also be, I've made quite a few radio programs for Radio 4. Uh, there was one on a couple of weeks ago on the Living World, which is still on the iPlayer. And this is about this amazing little bee, uh, possibly a bipolar, which nests in a snail shell and then covers the snail shell in grass and lets it wig wag over the shell and it's finished nesting it. But no one knows quite why it does it, but it's a fascinating bit of behaviour. So onto the house martins. This is uh, a lovely little bird, a very distinctive bird, and as its name suggests, it uh, has a close association with people. So it likes to, to live around where people are, so there's house martins uh, nesting within you know, a few hundred yards of the sea, I expect. It's part of the swallow and martin family, so there's a, a number of, large number of species spread across the world, quite exotic ones you get in Africa and uh, South America, so pretty well all the continents uh, have some species of uh, swallow and martin. Uh, the ones we get in Britain, we just have uh, these four species, uh, and they are the house martin, which we're mainly talking about tonight, uh, which has a distinctive white rump and pure white underparts and a forked tail. <coughs> Uh, then you have a sand martin, which is not so often seen. It uh, tends to live along riverbanks, and it's a little bit smaller than a house martin, and it has a brown chest band across its uh, uh, chest, a brown band across its chest, and rather brown upper parts. Uh, then the familiar swallow, or barn swallow, as it's, uh, as it's called, uh, with the long tail streamers and the red throat, which fellow often in the head, which just looks dark in flight, but uh, obviously a very familiar bird to uh, everyone here. And finally the swift, which is, I've got a picture of a hummingbird there, because swifts, although they fly around with the house martins and swallows, they are actually more closely related to hummingbirds. And if you look at the wing of a hummingbird and the wing of a swift, you can see the, the, uh, the, the close association there. It's just that a hummingbird obviously beats its wings a million miles an hour to hover, whereas the swift is designed for gliding, so it just uses the same wing design in completely different uh, ways of feeding. Now these birds have been around for millions of years. This is an old fossil, which is, uh, I think, found in Germany, which was about 49 million years old. Of course, the insects evolved first, so they were, they, and they were the first creatures to fly. So by the time birds evolved, evolved from dinosaurs, they were uh, a lot of insects flying around in the sky. So it's not surprising that some creatures uh, were fed on this rich supply of food. Uh, and, and the house martins and swallows, of course, still do that today. They've been steeped in mystery over the years uh, because of their sudden appearance <coughs> during the spring and then they suddenly disappear in the autumn time. Um, and it used to be thought that they actually hibernated and went down into the mud at the bottom of ponds. And this was, you know, I mean, it is quite incredible to think that a tiny bird like that would fly to Africa. It's almost inconceivable that they can do this. So it's not surprising that people came up with these theories. And they even, you know, illustrated uh, books people who are supposedly seeing this and drawing up house martins and swallows from the uh, riverbed during the winter and the lake bed. But of course this is complete nonsense. There is actually though, uh, in recent years, a bird which has been found to hibernate. And this is a North American nightjar or a common four-wheel. And this does go into a torpor, so it goes into a cave uh, in the winter months and just goes into a torpor and sits there quietly for several months and then comes out again in the spring. So it's not complete rubbish, but there's always one exception uh, to these rules. Now the house martins are common birds right across uh, northern Europe, right into Russia. Uh, the yellow area shows the uh, summer range of the bird, the winter uh, range is shown in blue. So most of the birds go back to Africa to spend the winter, although it's only in recent years that it's been found exactly where they go. Uh, for many, many years, until quite recently, very few house martins had ever been seen during the winter months. There was obviously that they went down into Africa, but no one could actually find them there. They're quite widely spread in Britain. There has been a big decline in Britain over the last 50 years or so, uh, but they're still widespread throughout most of Britain. And in Devon, there's been a, a decline of about 14 to 50 percent over the last 30 years. But again, it's still a widespread bird. So you can see the map on the left there, you can see 
there's been a big thinning out of the population over the last 30 years or so, uh, but it's still found in, you know, in the majority of the county. And Dartmoor is now one of the real havens for it, because we still have uh, plenty of semi-natural habitat, which provides them with flying insects, which waft up into the air and provide food for these birds. And the reason for this decline is uh, really due to changes in land use. So this is a, I mean, a photo which shows this. This is a Sir Abbas giant in Dorset. And if you stand on the, uh, the hillside where the giant is, you're in, on a really old chalk grassland, which is a protected grassland. And there you're surrounded by thousands and thousands of insects uh, all flying into the sky. Uh, but if you look around in the surrounding countryside, all the meadows that were once there have all pretty well gone. It's all changed to silage production, more intensive farming. And this has resulted in a huge loss in the number of flying insects. And this is what has led to the decline of not just house martins, but a lot of other birds as well. The swift is one of our most amazing birds, really. It, it spends almost its entire life on the wing. So it uh, makes a huge migration down into Africa. So the birds uh, at this time of year, they won't be with us much longer now. They'll be nesting around the buildings here in Ashburton. Um, and you'll hear them screaming around for the next couple of weeks. But by the time you get to August, they all head off and they fly down into Africa. Um, and they won't ever land they, um, until they come back here. They only ever land when they're nesting. So they'll fly all the way down there. They sleep on the wing. They just rise up into the air in the evening. And you can watch them actually at this time of year. It's a good time to see that just before they go. If you sit out in the evening and you see the screaming parties of swifts, just watch them and then they go higher and higher and higher until they're just lost in the blue and they go out there and roost for the night. Sometimes they can drift off by many miles overnight and then they'll just come back again in the morning because they're such brilliant flyers. They basically glide around and use virtually no energy at all. So they made this huge migration and they come back usually about the 1st of May, pretty well bang on because they're such adept flyers that they can pretty well time their migration to perfection. And then you can see them around the towns, particularly around the towns and villages around Dartmoor, it's pretty, a very good place to see these birds. And particularly in the evening, you hear the swifts, that lovely sound of summer, is, particularly after a nice warm day like today. It seems to be a sort of echo of the, of the weather of the day by the sound of the swifts. They're louder and louder on the, after warmer and warmer days. So particularly if you get a, a really cold, wet spell in the summer, and then it's suddenly you get a nice day, the swifts seem to be really pumped up and they fly around crazily in the evening. And this is more of a social gathering for the swifts. After they've been feeding for the day, they will gather up and fly around the town screaming together. So as I said, they, they mate on the wing, they spend almost all their life, they preen on the wing, you see them sometimes preening their wing feathers and tumbling out of the sky a little way. So they are completely aerial birds, apart from when, of course, when they have to lay their eggs. Then they come into a roof space. Uh, this is in uh, where I live in Buckersley. Uh, and they come in here. It's an old uh, woollen uh, mill building uh, with a tent loft uh, just off the main street in Buckersley. And uh, when this was uh, used for wool uh, production, the slats in the roof there would have been opened throughout the whole of the roof space, and then the wool would have been dry there. So it's a, a historic building, obviously, which is protected now. But with these old buildings, there's still space under the, under the roof tiles there for the swifts to gain access. Whereas in a lot of modern buildings, of course, the, the, those spaces have been blocked up and the swifts can't get in there anymore. So uh, there's a, a nest box design I'll show you in a minute. Uh, what they do is they, they don't actually make a nest as such. They just go in under the eave and find a little level platform there, just, just tucked in under the eave, and they'll lay one or two eggs there. And this is a female with a youngster, pretty well grown about this time of year, almost ready to fly. So when the young bird flies, it will just drop out of the, uh, of the roof, fly, and then if it survives, it might not land for two or three years, because they won't breed, they, they have quite long in birds, and they won't breed for a couple of years. So at that time, it will just fly around with all the other swifts, and it won't land at all until it actually has to nest itself. So, um, you can put up swift nest boxes, it's a good idea to do. Um, you can get the information off online. Uh, they have a, a, a special uh, size hole which is meant to prevent other birds getting in, but mine doesn't seem to stop <laughs> So I've got out some various STM in mine. I think Kevin's got some in his as well. Uh, but they are good, good boxes for swifts. 
and they, they definitely will use the indicators. The swallows and martins are different to the swifts, they will actually make a nest and they use mud to make their nests. This is a, a continental species, a red run swallow nest in Spain. Uh, of course, mud has been used in evolutionary terms for a very long time. It was first used by insects such as termites, which are masters of construction of these amazing homes, air conditioned homes, which they make completely from mud. Uh, one of my favourite insects, the Heath Potter Wasp, which I've just been watching out on Bully Heath, up here at uh, Trader Mills, up on the, on the heath there. And this little wasp uh, makes beautiful pots out of the clay mud on the <coughs> tail. And then it uh, fly, lays an egg inside and then flies in with caterpillars, little long thin caterpillars, stuffs them into the pot. And then when it's all full up, it seals the pot up and its, and its larva is then enclosed with a, a fresh food supply for it to eat. It's a heath pot wasp. And of course people use mud as well to make uh, houses and, e and in Britain, and fairly recently, and in fact there are still people today uh, who, who make cob buildings. Uh, it's a very good, uh, cheap, uh, efficient way to make a building. Uh, this is a very old cob board. This is in Alfington Church. This is where we made the, the film on the bees, uh, the hairy footed bees at Alfington Church in Exeter. And if you go there, if you want to see a really nice old cob board, that's the, the place to go. Uh, because Exeter's got the red clay soil, so it's an ideal spot for making cob buildings. And that wall is many hundreds of years old, and it's a, certainly it's stood the test of time. It's, so they're obviously very good at making cob in those days. And that's the hairy, which is flowering of the field uh, board in the churchyard there. Now the sand martins, uh, they don't actually construct a, a nest from mud, but they, they're more primitive. Uh, than the swallows because they actually just dig a burrow into a, a bank, usually a sandy bank as their name implies, and often along a river bank or in a quarry. Uh, this is a site along the River Tee, just uh, Tee Grace, just down below Stable Park, which is a good site to see sand martins. The swallows, of course, use mud as well, and they're familiar birds, as all people here have got swallows in their houses or barns or else they go to a porchway. They like to get in under, uh, under in a dry spot. So this is the number of sites they use, Any, anywhere that's like that that they can gain access into and there's a suitable ledge for them to build their mud nest on, they will use. Uh, this is down by the co-op in Buckersley, there's a little walkway through and there's often pairs of swallows which nest on the rafters just under there. So it's a good place for them just to fly in and out of. And again, up in the old church, up on the hill near me in, in Buckersley, uh, they nest in the porch. They're nice and dry, they can sit in there, they can have their young, and they'll raise two or three broods over the summer, and uh, the young birds will roost inside the porch at night. Uh, so there's plenty of room for them, you get off and get two or three nests there. And they'll be nesting right throughout the summer, so they start, they arrive towards the end of March, early April, and then they'll be breeding right through until sort of July, August into September. Now the house martins originally, of course, they didn't have houses, you know, thousands of years ago. It's only when we've started to build houses that they colonised them, and now they mainly do nest on houses. But originally they nested on sea cliffs, and there are still a few places in Britain where they still do nest on sea cliffs. But the vast majority of them have never seen a sea cliff probably in their life, but they have, they've probably forgotten that they were ever meant to nest on sea cliffs. We built all these thousands of artificial cliffs around the countryside, and so they colonised these. So a typical site, they like to, again, not be right underneath like a swallow. They tend to be just tucked in on a, on a cliff-like structure, uh, which is a wall in this case. This is on my son's house, actually in Germany, an old mill where he lives, and there's a big colony of house martins, and they're all tucked in just neatly under the uh, under a little bit of shelter, so it's nice and dry, um, but uh, not enclosed, so they can just drop out freely from the nest. Often you spot the nest by actually seeing a mess, like the poo on the on the pavement below. Uh, this is one in the main street in Buckley, which is actually tucked in amongst some plastic guttering, and it's quite difficult to see. It's only because I saw the poo that I actually found the nest. And you can see it's there, tucked up there, really nice and neat and snug. And uh, that nest is, is pretty well permanent because the winter rains don't get to it, so it's completely dry. So the birds which use that nest can just come back in the spring, might have to patch it up a little bit, but they can carry and get on nesting very quickly. Uh, they can, they usually nest fairly high up, 
out of reach, but they can nest low down as well if there aren't suitable sites. Uh, this is down at Prawl Point in East Prawl, uh, where they nest on the toilet block. They're not too far above head height. There's a nest there. So it takes about two or three weeks for them to build the nest. And how many bits of mud does it take? A thousand. A thousand little beetles of mud they collect to, to build their nest. So it's a real, a real construction job for the pair, and both of the pair uh, construct the nest. Uh, there is a case actually of uh, a pair, this is in Britain, but between Denmark and Sweden there were a number of pairs which ne once nested on a ferry when they used to travel between Denmark and Sweden in the summer and they were perfectly right next to on this ferry. Of course these birds have to make hazardous migrations, so that's the biggest, you know, it takes the biggest toll of them. Uh, so you know, when they leave here in the autumn they have to fly right down through the Mediterranean, across the Sahara Desert, down to their winter, wintering grounds in Africa, and then all the way back north again. So it's about 50% of the adult birds from each year will return, and about 40% of the young birds of the year will return the following year. And as I said, it was only recently that they found out where these birds actually go. And this was because some very clever scientists who were also ornithologists who studied isotopes of water. So it's a strange combination, but they had this idea that they could work out where the house martins were going in the winter by looking at isotopes of water, which they, which have all been mapped out in Africa. And what they did was they knew that the, they knew a bit about the ecology of the birds, and they knew that the house martins molted their wing feathers during the winter months. So those feathers are made of insects which have drunk of water in a certain place in Africa, and so these isotopes of water have ended up in those feathers. So when the birds fly back here, they just have to snip a tiny bit of the feathers off and then analyse the, the isotopes of water in, in those feathers and then relate that to a map of Africa and they worked out that the birds go into the Congo, so down in the blue map there in the middle over the Congo uh, rainforests and uh, this is where a lot of other birds go, such as our cuckoos which have recently been tracked up there. So it's a, a real hot spot for our migrating birds, our summer visitors which head down to this spot in Africa. And another, another way they can tell they feed to certain parts of Africa is that any birds which have returned from Africa in the springtime will be carrying various malarial parasites. So they've obviously picked these up in certain areas of Africa, so this is another clue to finding out exactly where they've gone. And so that's their migration route. And for a bird which is smaller than a sparrow, it's an incredible distance to go, it really is. So you can see why they used to think they, they used to have hibernating mud, because who believed? I mean, it was only really, it was actually only in the 1970s that it was actually proved for certain that these birds did migrate down to Africa. And for, for certain, it was saying as recently as that that the evidence was put together. So, you know, an incredible migration for a tiny little bird. It's amazing that any get back. They arrive usually in the middle of April, they start looking for them, sort of sometimes towards the end of March, you'll get a few house martins, um, but usually mid to late April they'll appear and they'll often go straight to the nest, nests uh, which from previous years, check them out and take them over, because obviously new, uh, old nests are really vital uh, places for the, for the birds to, to nest in, because these, they don't have to do any work. There's a lot of work, obviously spending two or three weeks building a new nest and collecting all that mud. It's far better to find a previously used nest and use that. But some birds haven't got that uh, choice, so they have to go and collect mud from muddy puddles, and then they'll start building a little ledge like this and build their nest up from there over uh, two or three weeks. And then once it's complete, they have a little entrance and they can stick their heads out of, and then they'll line it often with a few feathers as well. Uh, this is a, an artificial nest box, and you see we've got a few. Uh, here is a uh, prizes in the raffle at the end of the talk. And uh, if you put these up, and uh, one trick is to, that makes them even more acceptable to the house martins is to, before you put them up, cover them in mud, uh, just get a bit of clay mud and just splatter that one over them, and put them up. And uh, the house martins will either use them, or they're quite social birds, so if they see there's some nests there, they'll think, oh, other house martins have been here, we'll build a nest next door. So uh, that's a, a, a good thing to do. And, uh, Hopefully some or many of you here will walk away with a, a free house martin nest box at the end of the day at all. And as I said, they, they often come down because how, unlike the uh, swifts, the swallows and martins will land on the ground and land on perches. 
and they do roost uh, in their nests often at night. Um, and so these house martins will come down to collect the martin, they'll also collect a few feathers to line their nest. Uh, they lay small white eggs, and they again, like the swallows, have two or three broods of young during the summer months. And the house martins will, the, the young birds from the earlier broods will help to feed the later broods. And all the young birds will roost together in the nest. So by sort of September time, you can have 10 or 12 house martins all roosting in one nest at night. Uh, so the adults come in feed the young, and they're obviously feeding them on flying insects. So all sorts of things, mainly flies, but also small moths, uh, spiders which balloon up into the air, um, and uh, beetles as well. So all sorts of insects. And really, if you think about the air at this time of year, during the summer, it's like a very thin soup of insects. So this is why these insect, these insectivorous birds come here, make all that massive journey to come here to feed because of this rich supply of food, particularly over places like Dartmoor. Of course, one of the, their biggest enemies is the weather in Britain. Uh, bad weather will cause them, you know, obviously, a lack of flying insects. Uh, the swifts are such good flyers that they can just fly off. They could go to France and to escape the bad weather. If you get big thunderstorms, they'll fly all the way around them. Getting, picking up insects off the, off the updrafts from around the thunderstorm, but they can end up flying hundreds and hundreds of miles. But with such good flies, they can just whiz back in no time at all. Uh, the swallows and martins have more of a problem, and you can see yeah, we've had recent bad weather in, in the last few weeks. Um, on those really wet days, you see the swallows skimming really low across the ground, or out on the moor, you see them sort of against some uh, bank of trees and conifers on top of Benford Reservoir. Uh, in that really bad weather, and there are about 30 or 40 swallows and martins all just feeding in the lee of the trees there, just where the flies are collecting. So they are quite adaptable, but they, they do suffer a bit in very bad summers. Uh, but these birds are working very, very hard. So right through the summer, uh, some other clever scientists have actually me measured the amount of energy these birds are using. They've found that they're working just as hard as a Tour de France cyclist does. But they're doing it for, from dawn to dusk for you know, a few months during the summer months. Uh, they don't get a rest or a massage at the end of the day. They have to go <laughs> flat out, really. So by the end of the summer, they must be exhausted. Um, and then they've got to make that huge migration down into the Mediterranean and then move down into Africa. So they really, really are tough little things. Uh, this is an unusual thing. This is a, a cross between a, a swallow and a house martin. So it's an unusual bird. It's uh, very rare to see one of these. I've never seen one myself. I just found this picture on the, on the web. Um, but the birds in, in any one nest uh, may be fathered by, actually by different uh, males. So uh, they're not, although the, the pair will have a nest together, the female will often nip off and nest with a uh, mate with another male down the road and the male and the male and the other female. So a lot of this goes on in the, the world of birds. <laughs> So but this is probably good for the genetics of the birds, so they get a mixture of uh, different genetic uh, strains within the nest. And uh, so hopefully some of those birds will be strong enough to make that massive journey, because they come out of the nest, and within a few weeks they've got to start this migration down into Africa. And that's a little house martin just come out of the nest, so just fledged, show a tiny little bird, you see my hand there. Um, and that's within, that was in sort of August time. So within about four or five weeks, that bird would have to start this huge migration. It's never done it before. Uh, they do travel together to a certain degree, but also yeah, they might end up traveling on their own. Uh, but they know exactly where to go. They'll migrate down to their wintering grounds and then hopefully survive and return in the springtime. And uh, as I said, they do nest quite late. So this was in September, and uh, this was uh, a late brood of young, still being fed in the nest. And they can have young even into October. When the weather starts to get bad in October, they, any, they will have to go in the end. So if the young aren't big enough, they, they do get left behind. But any which have fledged before that time, by the end of September, are big enough and they'll, they'll get out. And those ones have got to go straight away. So I'm not sure how they cope. Mm -hmm. Just learning to fly and then suddenly flying for thousands of miles. They do have a number of predators. Uh, this is a falcon called a hobby, uh, which nests around Dartmoor. And this bird times its breeding season to coincide with a glut of young swallows and swifts and martins towards the end of the summer. So it's young will be in the nest in August, September time, they'll be full grown and uh, they feed a lot on young birds. So they're not so good at catching the adult birds, 
but the youngsters, which are just on the wing, are easier prey for the, the hobby. And they do have some interesting parasites, you know, some well, it's bugs and things. Mm -hmm. These uh, these are little flat flies, which live on the on the swallows and the swifts, and they spend the winter in their nests. So they actually lay uh, the legs, which uh, or pupae, which survive over the winter. And then when the birds return in the spring, these little flat flies hatch out and they latch onto the birds and spend the summer <coughs> sitting on them, uh, sucking a bit of their blood. Um, and then they uh, drop off again in the autumn. <coughs> They're quite interesting little insects. They actually care for their young within their body. So a bit like a mammal, they have a placenta and then their larvae are actually inside the body. And then they give birth to live larvae, which then soon pupate. So they're very interesting little bugs. Now, as I said, there's been a huge decline in these birds over the last 50 years or so. And we have got some hard evidence to support uh, what obviously is the cause, which is a lack of food. There's plenty of places for them to nest. Um, this is the sites of a Rothamsted uh, survey where they uh, have these suction traps which suck all the insects out of the air um, during the daytime uh, in, uh, during some months. And they found that over the last 30, 40 years, there's been a value of 80 or 90 percent decline in the number of flying insects uh, which are flying around our, you know, the sky during the summer. And for those who get older and in the crowd will remember that uh, years ago you couldn't drive anywhere uh, in the summer without having to wash your windscreen every five minutes. Uh, whereas now, that's you can drive around all summer pretty well without ever having to do that. And that really, that's a more graphic illustration of what this huge decline in the number of flying insects that have, has taken place and has led to the decline in not just our swans and swallows, but many, much of our other wildlife which relies on insects for food. Uh, the last thing about the nasty people who uh, set up this website and have a company which actually uh, provides, although it's illegal to actually destroy a house martin nest, they have actually uh, various devices for dissuading house martins and swallows from nesting on their house. Seems a rather negative thing to do to me, um, but uh, it's not illegal as such, but it just seems a, a bit bad to me. And this bridge, this is in, on the River Thames in Oxfordshire, is a classic example of, of, to show the, the decline of these birds. Because in the 1940s and 50s, there were many hundreds of pairs of house martins nesting on this bridge. And by the 1960s, there were a handful, and now there are none at all. And if you look on an aerial photograph of this site, all the old water meadows around the River Thames, which would have been teeming with life, uh, have now been converted to intensive farm, uh, uh, silage fields, that sort of thing. And now, basically, all that food supply, that massive insects has gone, and the house martins and the swallows have gone as well. But luckily, yeah, there are you know, some positive things happening. There's more and more people now who are uh, buying up bits of land and creating uh, or recreating sort of wild meadow habitats, which is brilliant for wild, all sorts of wildlife, and especially good for uh, these flying insectivorous birds. Uh, there's the More Meadows group, I'm sure many of you here have been to the Dartmoor More Meadows group, but if not, have a, look, have a look them up online. Uh, there's lots of interesting people who share information about creating uh, wildflower meadows around the moor and elsewhere in Devon. If you'd like to have, read a bit more about uh, some of the science of the, of the house martins, there's a very, very good book, and we've got a copy here at the front, I'd like to have a look at it afterwards, called Guests of Summer. And this was written by a Dutch ornithologist, and uh, it's a very, very easy to read book which explains some of the science which I've spoken about this evening. I uh, thoroughly recommend that book. And if you'd like any more information about me, have a look at my website, which is John Walters, um, Thank you for listening. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the Dartmoor House Martin project and how it started. Um, it came out of two things, one of which I, we've touched on is the decline of swifts, but also a story that I was told that one of my neighbours, who shall remain nameless of course, actually knocked all of the uh, house martin nests off his, um, off, off the, uh, the, the farm building. Um, which, and I thought, well, there's no point. Of course, you know, this was uh, before the breeding season, fortunately, so I was told. And the birds have come back. I'm not sure how happy he is about this. But the very point we saw in John's talk about um, 
companies being set up to discourage birds because there's a bit of mess on the ground. I thought there's no point in going and broaching the subject with him. It's much better to encourage people to find out about how fantastic these birds are. And all the stories that John has told us earlier, I think it tells an amazing story about these birds, how far they travel, how much work they do creating their nests. So this project came around and we started last year as a joint project of Devon Birds, Dartmoor Preservation Association, the National Park and the Duchy of Cornwall, with some funding which has gone into um, the artificial nest boxes which I many of you will take away from the People's Postcode Lottery. So the Devon Bird Atlas, which John alluded to earlier, was published at the beginning of last year. And uh, this was the second Devon Bird Atlas that came out, and a repeat of one that was uh, uh, published during the 1980s, so it was almost 30 years on. And what it showed was, as John said, a decline particularly of house martins of around 40 to 50 percent uh, across the whole of Devon. And Dartmoor, not on the high moor, but certainly on the periphery and along the, the, the central section of Dartmoor, remains very much a hotspot for house martins, uh, particularly in some of those villages and more of the isolated farms. But what we've also seen is much the same picture repeated for Dartmoor with many of our other birds as well. So if we look at Curlew, for example, Curlew over the last 30 years have suffered a decline of about 97%. Uh, we think there is only one pair of breeding <coughs> Curlew in the whole of Devon now, and they are on Dartmoor. And it's pretty unlikely given they uh, were successful uh, yet last year, predated this year, and the last time they raised a chick was in 2008. But Curlew is very likely to go extinct as a breeding bird in Devon uh, in the next few years, unfortunately. Lapwing as well, there are only two breeding sites for lapwing. This is a bird that even 30 years ago would have been found across the farmed areas of Devon. And the story is repeated with birds like Skylark, which has disappeared from a lot of our farms, partly because of agricultural change, the move to silage, earlier cutting. So many of our ground nesting birds have suffered significant declines. Cuckoos, if you want to hear a cuckoo, the only place you're going to hear one now a breeding cuckoo is up on Dartmoor because uh, whereas 30 years ago they were pretty widespread across the county, that's no longer the case. So we thought, you know, here's a small bird that often people don't notice that often. Certainly, as John showed, many of their nests are tucked away, they're quite secret. Even Ashburton, which I live down the road as well in, in Buckfast, and if you ask me how many house martins were nesting here in Ashburton, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. So they're, they're, they're here, but they're quite secretive, and what we need to do is find out exactly how well they're doing. So it was a really this desire to move from the survey work, and remember it's quite hard if you're doing a bird survey uh, for all the species to look specifically at a bird that might be tucked up in the eaves of the house in town. Um, so we really wanted to move to do something positive for the uh, the, the conservation of this bird. Um, and, re and here, just quickly, the aims and objectives of the, the, the project were to increase our knowledge of that, the distribution of this species, to really engage local communities, to tell the story of the bird, which you've heard from John, and then to do something positive, to take active measures to encourage people to conserve them and to look after them. So last year, in 2016, we took this on tour around some of the parishes uh, in order to find out really how well they were doing. And um, you'll see that Dunsford up in the top right, we found 84 active nests. Of the six parishes that we surveyed uh, and asked people to report on, Dunsford uh, was the number one parish on Dartmoor. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, I'm sure there are birds all over. We just don't know exactly where they are. And part of the project this year is to expand uh, the Dartmoor House Martin project to make it Dartmoor wide. So we're really looking for as many nests as we can. And we wanted to go out, and this was something that the Dartmoor National Park Rangers did, working with children, particularly here at the uh, Festival of Nature at Melbourne, 
and they were using these natural, uh, nat National Health Service sick bowls, <laughs> putting mud in them to create nests that then were put going up. All. Now, I'm not suggesting that that is the best way, and very often, I'm sure, these didn't last the winter. Uh, if they went up in the spring, the hope was that they would encourage birds to build nests alongside them. So it's very much about giving birds a sense that there is a community there. So it was, it was, it was about going out and telling the story to the local community, including on Radio Devon, and giving away the nest policies. So what we're asking people here to do is a number of things, but most importantly is to go out and survey for house martins, and I can tell you how where, whereabouts to record them. But it's about looking out for active nests, recording the address, looking under the eaves without necessarily appearing like the peeping Tom when you're doing it. So be cautious about this, but during the day it should be fine. Counting the number of nests, and we're very keen on those sites, number of active nests and the total number of nests, because very often colonies have decreased, but the nests are still in situ. So we're very much looking for a number of active and then recording any other information that you can. We don't know, for example, whether birds favour one side of the building rather than another. There's some suggestion, I've seen them, you know, on all sides of, of buildings. So we're very much trying to collect as much information as we can about the birds, including one of the things height off the ground. I've put house martin nest boxes up on uh, a barn or a small cottage not very high off the ground, and I've never even seen them looking there. However, and, and I think we, John and I talked about this, I think they're just too low. I've been out to Darkmeet and Brink's Farm, which many of you will know, and you can go to the barn there and you can almost touch the nests, and they're all lined up. So, fickle birds, we don't understand everything about them, and we're trying to get a bit more knowledge. All of this, from last year and this year, this information will be shared with the BTO, uh, the British Trust for Ornithology, which has a, a, a house martin project nationwide running at the moment. Two ways to submit records, I'll come on to the second at the moment. One is to send it to uh, Richard Knott, that's not him, uh, the ecologist at the uh, National Park, and um, the address is on the website that you'll see there, dartmoorhousemartins.org. But the second way is just submitting uh, straight onto the website. Um, if you go onto the website, you'll see that there are already a lot of records that have been put in. What we'd ask you to do is just either pinpoint on the map where you've seen those nests, or better still, to put the address in, because Google Earth doesn't always correlate the address with the map. And then to record all of that other information, active nests, total number of nests, and anything else that you've collected there. <coughs> There's also a lot of other information and a reminder of many of the things that John's talked about in his talk, if you want to go on there. So that's dunmorehousemartins.org. So there are four things that we're going to ask you to do. We've talked about some of the reasons for decline. John specifically mentioned the loss of insects. Um, yeah, wherever you are, and however large or small in your garden, the best thing you can do is put away the mud. You're wasting energy, you're wasting time, and actually you're destroying probably the best thing in your garden that is going to create an environment for not just house martins, but all those other birds, most of which rely on insects, particularly during the breeding season when they're feeding their chicks. So even though you might be feeding birds in the garden with seeds, what you're doing is making sure that the adults are well fed enough to have the energy to go out to collect insects for their chicks. Now, my house sparrows at the moment, the ones that are in my other um, nest boxes, are, are currently out in the field in front of the house collecting grasses and crickets and taking them back to the young. The other thing is working part, as part of the community to create as many hay meadows as we can. I think this one was at Chagford. Uh, Chagford has a community meadow. Uh, the group have got together. Here you see people spreading green hay. This is hay that's been cut that day from flower-rich meadows uh, locally. The ground has been scarified so that it will receive this green hay, and then that green hay, full of seed, is spread before it's had a chance to heat up and compost, all on that ground. 
if you haven't got large enough space, what I'd say is the best way of creating the canvas for a hay meadow is yellow rattle. This is a semi-parasitic plant. It will decrease the, the um, vigour of the grasses in your meadow and will then give the opportunity afterwards to introduce other species as well. Put up an artificial nest box. I hope that many of you will go away with one today and that they will go up. They do need to be under uh, an eave, so there's a bit of shelter. You can see these are my two that I put up last year. These are the ones that have got the house sparrows in. Uh, but they do need, oh, sorry, they do need to go up uh, for, for, for um, up this way, obviously with holes at the top, but under a bit of shelter. The more there is, the better. Um, and then, if you can, which I failed to do, smear a bit of mud on them before they go up. And possibly one of the things I would have done, although I didn't physically put them up, I got painted to do it, is left a gap in between in order maybe for the house martins to have created a nest in between. And finally, what I'd ask you to do is spread the word. Because not just my name, but many people uh, have a problem with some of the nests that these birds uh, create. In Germany, if you go, and John showed a picture of where his son lives, didn't have this. If you go, and a lot of the time you'll see in Germany, right underneath the nests, just a small shelf put up. And that shelf then is taken down at the end of the season and cleared. But actually, for the amount of mess that these birds create, frankly, a piece of cardboard that's put underneath and taken away at the end of each week isn't a great loss when you consider how, how fantastic these birds are and the journey they've made. I think we have a duty to do all we can to give them room on our houses for the short period of time that they share with us to give them a space to breed and to feed. So that's all. what I'd ask is uh, if you could take away some of these. When you find active nests on some of your neighbours' houses or places that you go to, just post one through the door. Do any more, not the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> what it has on the back is all of the information that uh, some of which we've talked about here, a little bit about the ecology of the birds, a bit about the fact that they're in decline, and if people are worried about the mess, there's some suggestions of what you can do to mitigate it. So please take away a few of these, put them through people's um, letter boxes if there are active house marking on their houses and do as much as you can in terms of creating the environment that will breed the insects that will feed the house martins and swallows and the swifts uh, for Dartmoor so that for generations to come we will still see the wonderful birds coming back from Africa each year. So thank you all very much.